The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. That is a very satisfying entry, Algian, and a really wonderful beginning to this second compilation of website entries, website subscriber entries, to the 2023 Orchestration Challenge. So um, we're just going to jump straight into this, but just one word at the beginning, and that is that uh, these are going to be a little briefer than before. I'm going to try not to go on for, you know, long periods of time on little structural or conceptual errors, um, just because my own time is very limited this year. And also, you know, it's just better to keep these things moving along. Uh, but in this case, <clears throat> with Algion's entry, I felt it was, you know, just very beautifully conceived. I liked the wonderfully calm vibe or the calm feeling of the piece. There are a couple little strange things like right in here, the, the voicing of this chord seemed to be rather odd. And uh, I feel that the, I feel, I feel that the, um, you know, for the, for the sound of that, um, that sort of implied ninth, um, the E needs to be closer to the D, right? So it's just it's just it's just way too far to put it way down here in the bassoon. So I mean, there there's just some some choices that are a little strange. But um, anyway, the the it's a very very cool uh, opening, and I, I really love these um, measured tremolo Fs here in the cellos. You might want to mark uh, Divisi here, right? So just to, I mean, not that there could be any other way of playing it, but just, you know, just uh, for propriety's sake. Uh, here, you're trying to keep within the, um, the natural tuning, and I, I can see how that sort of would possibly affect the way that you'd voice some of these chords. Uh, and <clears throat> all of these pitches are nice open pitches on, you know, on your horns and solely, right? And as you go forward, you end up with um, a solo clarinet. Now, <clears throat> here we sort of get into like tweaking, the whole question of tweaking the dynamics and so on. I think it, you know, might be better just to have everybody solely kind of working together and then the six instrument or the six wind and brass players will <clears throat> really be listening to each other and trying to balance all of the parts and you know you, you get a better result that way than if you were to sort of micromanage the dynamics however um, <clears throat> just to point out you can give them a little bit of of leeway here I mean do you feel do you feel a crescendo here Da 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 da. Then a little diminuendo. Da 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 da. You know, I think it's okay to indicate a little bit of warmth in the middle of the phrase here. 
Yeah, but I mean, nicely done. Uh, nice, uh, in, uh, nice positions. You know, the the f horns and the and the bassoons working together and so on. Yeah, just the yeah the voicing of this chord just felt just you know just really didn't do it for me. <clears throat> Now, moving forward, I thought this was a very elegant solution, just like, you know, you have these um, these pulsing strings in the middle, the middle strings right in here. And just very simply stated, first violins, uh, allowing the, uh, <clears throat> allowing the, the natural leader of the Beethoven orchestra to come forward. And of course, just these, these, um, pedal F's here, sounding F's, uh, was, was beautiful. It's something, it's something similar to what I did in my score. And nicely uh, apportioned slurring right in here. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that, I mean, do you really want to give up the emphasis on the downbeat of the bow? You know, I mean, couldn't you just go down, up, down, up, down? Right? Or even down, up, down, up, down. Right? Um, as opposed to <laughs> up, down, up, down, up, down. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, it is still smooth, but it just. Yeah, I, don't, I just. Yeah. And. On this, you can you can also um, slur half bars, you know, da da da. You know, they're just like really getting the. Um, it doesn't have to, you know, da. You know, it could be da 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 da. I mean, I think they just you know the, if you give even like short little groups of of notes, um, if you divide up the. Uh, divide up the bowing a little bit. Yes, it gets you know it goes towards being choppy unless everything is legato. But on the other hand, the um, the player has so much more control expressively and you know in and just in terms of the flow. And this is lovely here. Da -da 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 -dum. And uh, this was lovely to do the um, to play this in octaves rather than you know having clarinet play the top part and then bassoon play the bottom part which is something that I did and this is also great the idea of um, of having the strings respond and to support the strings harmonically rather than the winds right and then when you've got the octave in there of stating the first little bit of um, of motive then you kind of need less support harmonically right so this works beautifully octaves and then it strings da 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 dum da 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 dum da 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 dum ba da 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 dum. Yeah, that was all very beautifully done. Now here we've got the um, first oboe jumping up the octave in the middle of this phrase. Da 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 bum bum. Yeah, I mean it. It more or less works. Um, yeah, I mean, there are just really no problems there. You obviously don't want to send your oboe player all the way down there to a B, right? You could have made the transition here on the G. I think it would be smoother. Da, da, ba, da, 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 da. Rather than da, da, I just think that this jump right here is pace, it sort of draws a little bit of attention to itself. But I mean, you're you're quitting right at this C, right? And you're just letting the sound of the crescendo strings absorb the the line above from the um, from the winds. And it's interesting that how you how you have harmony that goes above the line here. Uh, I mean, it more or less works. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, did you notice in your mock-up there was just this sudden jerking kind of um, leap forwards almost sounded like somebody was um, was just like pushing us like a um, pushing a button on a mixer to where the the volume suddenly jumped up to a mezzo forte 
So I don't know what the uh, what the playback engine is like for the application you're using. Uh, I'm suspecting MuseScore possibly, but yeah, but there's that's something that they need to fix. If that's something that happens all the time in a situation where you know you're playing softly and then you have subito mezzo forte crescendo, you know, then like the difference between these notes is a sudden jerking, you know jump forwards of the, or jump upwards in dynamics yeah i mean this is all all cool right in here i didn't really have any big problems with this i like the fact that you're sort of trying to stay within the rules notice though you will have one little stop a in here right but i mean in in the context of everything else that is playing at the same time you know that that same note is covered by this d here uh, this written a is going to be sounding d the same note as this written e here so you've got a little bit of cover and also in the sense of like in the context of everything being softer and all sort of playing together in this lovely courtly chord right there's you it's just very courtly the way that you've scored this i don't i didn't think that you really needed this um this kind of big chord here at the end maybe just to kind of show me um a larger um you know bit of 2t scoring uh, but you know just to just to sort of mention this for future um for future orchestration challenges like if you know if you're just doing the website um uh, portion of the challenge or or maybe supporting on patreon and doing like a shorter um, a shorter excerpt you do not need to throw kind of a conclusion onto the end you can just have it just per you know proceed onwards you don't have to bring things to a close but you know, having said that, it's not a bad tutti chord. It almost like begs for a uh, for um, some timpani action here, right? Going doing a five one. Yeah. Now here, if you if you are thinking of um, thinking in terms of horns in F, like natural horns, and then natural trumpets in C, then uh, the problem here is that this A isn't a isn't a possible note, right? So with a with a um, valve trumpet or valve cornet of the time back then, um, you know, say Berlioz era, then then it would, it's perfectly possible note. But in terms of like a like a natural C trumpet, you know, unless the player sort of sticks his hand in the bell, you're not going to get this A. All right. So uh, just a note there, but it's you know it doesn't really you know, make a big difference. This is all, you know, this this triple stop here, perfectly possible, easy. I've done, I've played that chord before. And yeah, of course, these um, this G octave and this C octave here is very, very easy. And this uh, C sixth here. So yeah, so you're saying non legato. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it all works for me. I, I mean, I, th I think this is a this is a beautiful piece of scoring that you've got, in Algian, and I, I'm not going to overdo it by picking it apart and and you know looking at every possible thing that you did right and wrong. But just to say that this is an you know for the period, this is this is an excellent uh, what would they call it today pastiche, right? It's a it's a really nice bit of. Uh, sort of period reminiscent scoring and yeah you know, I thought that the yeah you know, I thought that the the shape of it the proportions were really nicely done and I really liked the the dramatic proportions except for the the way the mock-up jumped the um, jumped the dynamic here um, suddenly forwards but yeah I mean I might I might have a slight issue with the way that the winds just drop out a little bit but I, I understand what you're trying to do is bring the line down to just this ya da 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 bum 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 and then answering an octave higher and you know the higher register so i mean it's, it's all good it all works for me so great work let's take a look at the next evaluation
Great work, Michael. <laughs> Another score that reaches for the period and does it in a very convincing way. Uh, I'm just going to flip down to show you that Michael has like scored the entire first movement, and it is a beautiful effort. Just wonderful. And Michael, if you're going to put this much work into it, you know, you just have to decide how much of it is worth your time, you know, for me to look at. And I am absolutely happy to, um, you know, if you were if you were to upgrade to, you know, to Patreon or something like that, um, I, I would have been delighted to look over this whole thing and give you uh, some feedback all the way through to the end. But, you know, I understand everybody's got a different situation or, you know, maybe just has, has a different level of commitment of what they want out of the challenge, and I respect that. But just saying, man, <laughs> it, was, it was such uh, a great effort. And uh, I think that Michael may have posted this on the Facebook group. So I would just say, if, if I'm right about this, uh, Michael, you can just sort of say in the comments whether I've done, whether you've done this, but uh, it might be worth searching in the Facebook group, in the Orchestrain, Orchestration Online Facebook group. Okay, so <laughs> let's dive into this. Um, yeah, so it was lovely. You you know you got uh, horns three and four in D, right? So and and you're in the key of G, and like yeah, so it just it works perfectly, beautifully, and it has that kind of there's just a, a wonderful sound to G major. Um, you know, it just has this this kind of warm feeling, um, and you know, I, I sort of feel uh, G major feels warm to me, and F major feels bright, if you know what I mean, right? and um, F sharp feels extra bright <laughs> to me. So, um, you know, those are, those are completely arbitrary impressions. They have nothing to do with reality, but, you know, especially considering that tuning systems um, over the centuries have really changed, like what, what is F and, and G and so on, and not to mention tempering systems. Um, all right, so <clears throat> starting off here, this you know this wonderful combination I'd say um, this merging of the texture of the pianissimo horns and the strings <clears throat> gives that the strings that beautiful warm sound and by using this strategy the one that you've got here you pretty much avoid stop tones except for this. E flat here, and and that you know that's <clears throat> in the context of the of the texture that you've got here. It's not going to be any concern whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I I would say I I think this is all really doable, and I think it'll sound beautiful. And um, I, I wonder, I'm wondering if this is another. Um, Mu score entry. I'm, uh, I, I was sensing like like whenever there were um, subito dynamics, like like going from this forte to this piano, there was a sudden cutoff. You know, it didn't have that sort of natural sound that I've, I'm used to with um, Sibelius all along. Has had fairly natural transitions. Um, I'd say from kind of like late, like 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 the version five and six. Uh, when when I was using I don't I can't even remember what I was using back then Garatan and and some other plugins and and then you know to the Sibelius sounds and and uh, Note Performer now and so on. So um, yeah, the transitions felt a lot more natural here. They just feels kind of stifled or I mean it just really sounds like you can you can hear somebody electronically turning things down and up. You know there just as a there isn't any kind of natural. Um, uh, decay or anything like that, like, like a forte, the the sound of the forte sort of um, a reverberating, you know, in the in the digital hall, and then being followed by soft instruments is just not there. Right. So anyway, um, this is a beautiful natural. Um, sounding oboe entrance i think you could you could have longer slurs you know i think you could you'd easily go da 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 you know i think 
I, I think that you know this could connect here this could be one slur or you could make a slur from there to there yeah and, the, and then this accompaniment is all just incredibly charming here in the clarinets and the um the patterned middle strings just beautiful right in there and then like the wonderful use of uh of natural brass right in here i, I love these d trumpets right in here just perfect you know and then very judicious assignment of pitches to avoid uh, stop tones you know the, you, you really manage to get away from a lot of the you know just a, any any kind of um of bending or um uh, or stopping half stopping and so on of course this f up here is going to have to be half stopped i believe and same with this one and so on but like the occasional pitch the occasional stopped or half stopped or three quarter stop pitch is, is, you know, I mean, that Beethoven does that, right? Berlioz does it all over the place. You know, if we're assuming that this was perhaps a posthumous um, arrangement, you know, say maybe made by an admiring composer back in the day, it, you know, turtle, totally, there's nothing that these horns couldn't play beautifully. And if you remember Annika's. Um, contribution to uh, of the um, of her interpretation of the Beethoven horn sonata to my um, to my pitfalls video you can see that like you know sometimes you only really get the squash tone when the player hits it hard right but like when they're on their way somewhere else <laughs> do you know what I mean like like they're kind of going from one place to another and the F is in between them or like it maybe it's at the end of three notes in a row or something like that. They have a way of just kind of you know sort of squeezing it in and just you know not may not sounding quite so eh, you know like you know but it they have a way of kind of making the making a sound a bit smoother. So all of that stuff you know even the greatest of natural horn players today is just approaching the ability of those players back then. You know of the great players back then. So, um, so I don't have any problems with the way that this is scored at the beginning. I think that's really wonderful. And then this is lovely in here. Um, I noticed that you have you have uh, scored your flutes mezzo piano and your violins piano, and and I'm guessing that this is to avoid having the um, the violins absorb the sound of the flutes, right? That is always a concern, especially with like kind of classical era. You you kind of expect the flutes to get sucked into the harp sound. Then here, but here, then you back up the the violins, and here in you know the, those flutes, you know that that uh, by adding strength to the violin part, like this will make the violins more present and then there's more danger of them disappearing. But I don't think it's a big concern. You know, like it, like it just depends on like whether the player allows their tone to be absorbed or whether they play out a little bit. And I think that that's what you're trying to tell them here. Uh, but do you really want them to go ta 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 wouldn't you rather have them go da 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 da, da um, right? You know, wouldn't you rather slur these? They just really feel, you know. I mean, I can see that ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum. I mean, I can see that this being more like these, tongued in individually, and there's no problem with tonguing each one and bowing each one individually. But just you know, I mean, do you really want that scurrying sound? And then here, do we really want da 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 da? Wouldn't you rather have da 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 da? Do you know what I'm saying? Is there a possibility that, like, with the energy, that just the beautiful um, uh, surge of color and intensity that you have scored here, just wonderfully so, I must say, just you know, which I'll, I'll expand on a little bit more in a minute. Uh, couldn't it be possible maybe to, like, just keep it strong? Right? Da, 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 Soft, soft. And then maybe back to forte. Da, 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 soft, soft. It just kind of feels more natural to just keep going. But, like, but 
uh, you know, if your natural impulse is to follow what Beethoven did, you know, to treat him as the authority here, uh, even though he changed tons of things in his own transcriptions, um, then I, I totally respect it, you know, just to see if it would work. Uh, I, I like the little, um, you know, you're, you're, you're coming in here an octave higher with your flute. This time you kind of keep the continuity. And keeping the continuity going, I think, is another strong argument for interpreting this stronger following, you know, you know, following the forte bar with another forte bar, right? If you're going to keep the continuity of the line up here an octave higher. Yeah, but I mean, it just it just feels like you want to slur here. And this is nice right in here. This um, one thing that that you might want to watch out for is the is stacking contrary motion like this. It has a sort of a strange, heavy kind of an effect. Sort of it it kind of tends to make things organ like, right? If you've got lines going towards each other, right, and then um, in the next register down, you have lines going towards each other, right, and then that's reinforced by other elements in the music, and then you have you have um, lines that cross each other, right? And then you sort of lose the you lose the um, the sense of space, right, when things are crowded together like that. I'm not saying that it didn't work here; it sort of did, but it kind of it's you know you still sort of hear that kind of crunchy effect or there's the sort of the sort of organ like effect so if you want more space less reminiscent of organ then just you know don't be afraid to you know to keep your lines more separate your functions more separate okay and more simplified rather than so stacked yeah and this is but this is just all really lovely bum 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 you know we once again we do have like you know, going up, going down, going up across the same register in the clarinets, right? So it's just sort of confused, like the ear cannot really make up what's going up and down when they're stomp stomping on each other like that. Uh, but I mean, it still worked, right? But just watch out for that in future, uh, in future instances. I mean, this is really nice, the horn scoring in here. I just, it was really, really beautiful. I love the way that you got that uh, you know, closer to that authentic color of the early 19th century. Really nicely done. So great work, Michael. Now, on to the next score. And another <laughs> great uh, sort of period reminiscent arrangement here. Um, and <laughs> I just I really like what's going on here. Um, I, I like the exposed bassoons and horns here in F. And I, I know it's just wonderful the way that you are trying to use them as natural horns. You know this this F here, of course, will um, will be half stopped, but uh, you know there are other instruments that will sort of compensate for that. You know you've got your oboe here and so on. Um, one thing that it's just a slight problem in here. Um, the way you start to thicken the texture, and then you have this solo oboe in here. Now, having marked it a solo, the player will play out, right? But that doesn't mean that you haven't set yourself a little bit of a trap with the thickness of the accompaniment, right? And it would have been great if you had been able to have another horn, like if you had, say, three horns in F, right? And 
you were you managed to sort of score them all. Um, uh, first and second, or first and third, and then from here having the first maybe play the solo rather than the oboe. See that would that would give you the best balance. But the um, I mean the oboe works fine. It just you know I mean I, I and I hate to say I will turn this into a mezzo piano or whatever just because I don't like doing that but you know piano is a very big region of the dynamic world right uh, and we can you know we can go in there and finesse things and have piano crescendo piano diminuendo mezzo piano pianissimo um, but you know just the actual piano piano in and of itself is a is a, is a whole realm right it isn't just this it isn't just this way this place where you stop on the way to somewhere else and i can see that in your scoring so you know it, it definitely the way that this is scored it will pretty much work uh, with one or two things that i'm going to point out or you might need to fix um and but you know just right in here it's not so much that the oboist will not play out on it their solo and things will be out of balance it's more that the thickness of the texture will be working against the clarity of the oboe solo right when we think about like what's going on in the piano part beethoven is stripping back more and more voices as he gets here towards the end so i'm just saying just you know think about that all right all right um but yeah, there's there's really kind of nothing wrong with this, and I, and I love the attention to detail you're you're giving to the slurring and so on. That, that's wonderful. And then yeah, just all very very nice, um, very nicely done, um, you know, management here of up bow and down bow and so on. Um, and, I mean, are you sure that you really want da da ta ta? I mean, it just feels a little unnatural. What if it were da da ta? Up, down, up, down, as opposed to up, down, up, down. But just, you know, just feels a little strange. Um, and but this is really lovely. And you know, this bum 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 bum, and um, yeah, clarinets in there. I mean, just a really beautiful, pleasant sound in here. And I it just, I think it's just really nicely combined. The um, the the texture of all the elements working together, the clarinets with the middle strings and the uh, horns with the cellos, and just you know, and then and then the the way that the functions start to start to change right in here. I feel that um, you have ticked all the boxes on the evaluation criteria. You've set the mood effectively with your intro. You start elegantly with your melody and you have a natural flow with the uh, accompaniment the transition to octaves just feels effortless is really nice and then you have this little bit of shine on top here so if you are willing to accept that uh, quite a deal of the identity and resonance of the flute will be absorbed into the first violin line then this is fine okay but you know if you go back to your Mozart, Beethoven, proper. You'll notice a lot of times, you know, there'll be a, there'll be a, a, a melody like this tracking the first violins at the octave, and the first violins being naturally stronger. In this period, you know, just really they carry a lot of weight and they, they really kind of lead the whole symphony around. You know, if you accept that, <laughs> that premise, then you have to accept that the that the flute here will get you know will will become just like the the shine from this line right and and if in that context is beautiful now here we get to the next question um you know are we contrasting this little riff with the theme we are are there contrasts between lines we'll get to that in a second are we adding harmonic support you are from above this time i think that's a wonderful variation from many of the other um, entries that I've seen so far and that we will see coming up. All right, so we're going to continue on. Da 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 dum. Da 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 dum. And this is really lovely. You are slurring forward to this and then slurring out from under it. But I would submit to you um, that you probably don't need to do this dovetailing right in here. 
because uh, I mean you will get some of the tonguing on the downbeat from the second player but then kind of slurring forward it's almost like a, an attempt to uh, cover the fact that the that there are two different players but you're, you're making things a little bit harder on the player by not having the note value of the first part be a 16th note so right so don't because this will cover like this this continuing written C will continue to play while the D is playing, right? So you get this bit of drag, and you know, kind of like the same thing here. You know, if you this this C down here is going to continue on underneath the uh, the E of the first part, right? So just watch out for this. Try to have them be the same note value as the note you're dovetailing on, and then you have beautiful seamless transitions between notes. I'm not sure, so sure if this works for me. Um, I might mention this in future evaluations where, where the orchestrator has chosen to go uh, up rather than down with their parts. You know, da 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 instead of da 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 dum Right? Da 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 dum And then it's like it also, um, you know, it's just, it sort of messes with the, with the exact uh, notation of the of the slur, right? Because because what is Beethoven doing in the original? He's he is, you know, he's going all the way up to the B and then jumping down to B rather than getting a little note on the way. So I feel that it it messes with the curve, right? It messes with the you know you're you're, you're sort of you're changing Beethoven's phrasing and so on in his, in his kind of his notes. But that, that's okay. I mean that, that is that is your choice. I'm not so sure that it works for me, but if it works for you, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the way that you've scored it, right? So it's just a, it's kind of like a taste thing. I, you know, I hear something different, but I still think that what you, your decision here works fine. And then, you know, once again, this transition. Okay, so like I, I sort of, I've sort of bypassed what I really wanted to say about this, and that is, you know, you know to make it a little clearer, um, you know, don't you want a like a clear da ta rather than dum dum, which is like if you get a perfectly synced um, dovetailing right in here, then you know you you don't feel the tonguing on this so much from the second player. Um, you might want to set things up like here. I notice that you have eliminated the. Um, the rest in the second part and I think that that's a mistake um, hang on a second all right so if we just turn this into a half note see like this is this is so much clearer right just and the same thing kind of like if we go back up yeah, see, like here you've given you've given the score reader, your conductor or whoever, the you know letting them know that this is the first rather than the second part, right? And then and then the same thing here. Okay, all right. So continuing on, um, yeah. So so just you know more aesthetics here. Do you want you know up down up down up down, right? Or do we want up down up down? All right, so it just you know it just depends on how much back and forth you want with the bow. Now, there are two other things. All right, see, like I, I realize I'm forgetting things. Okay, you don't need to do this. You don't need to push on this written C sounding F here. All right, and the same thing is true here. You don't need to push with your background chords. Right, so if you're if you're trying to emulate Beethoven and so on. Sometimes you'll have uh, a passage where the strings play out and they're doing something like this thematically. Winds and horns are in the background and they're kind of playing chords. Um, unless I, I'm finding with Beethoven, unless the passage is really on its way somewhere, then rarely do you get the winds and the brass marked like this, like just for a bar crescendo and then back to piano, right? So I would say just leave them in the background because they are, by their very nature, obscuring the clarity of this line. 
right? And that's perfectly fine the way that you've scored it. I, I don't have any problem with that. that I, I think it's really enchanting the way that you start off with this, um, uh, the um, harmonized uh, run of notes in sixths, and then here you sort of close the gap and then go to a unison, and that's also very effective. Um, but by having the harmony, you know, you have four-part harmony above your um, above your violins in you know in the two brightest uh, instruments, or say four brightest instruments if you're counting pairs of the orchestra, right? So this is messing with the clarity of this line, right? So it's just really it's kind of hard to make out make this out, and you don't have you don't have any um, hang on. You don't have any doubling of this melody in any of your winds, right? So, like, there aren't you don't have clarinets down here or anything. So the uh, not that you would need to, but it's just that with the amount of tone weight that you've got here, so that's all the more argument to not crescendo here. Um, you know, it may be even starting stronger with your strings here, like at mezzo piano, keeping this in the background at piano, and then you know we get to the same question that I have asked before. Uh, you know, should this be, should this, you know, if you're going crescendo here, should this, um, you know, should this next passage maintain the same strength, right? So that we kind of have a follow through. Da 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 bum bum bum. Or should we fall off the cliff, you know? Da 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 dun dun dun. Either way is fine. Um, I think this is sort of a. It just depends. Like when you are trans, when you're transcribing things to orchestra, like a lot of the, um, a lot of the inferences, a lot of the natural energy and the flow, um, changes. Right, the presumptions change. Like what needs to be maintained, the the might be, you know, the logic might be completely different. And I like the way that you you change the texture right in here. That's really lovely, you having the lower winds emerge from this chord here at the end. See, and here's another reason why it's it's like what you've done here is a little problematic, right? So you have all this harmony happening above, and uh, this line of triplets here is sort of finding its conclusion in the lower winds, right? So, so the continuity of it still has this stuff hanging above it, which makes it really hard for the ear to sort of follow, right, in an obvious way. Which, you know, you don't need to have it be obvious, but if you are trying to emulate Beethoven, he always, like, points you the right direction without any clutter, right? So so he probably would consider this to be kind of cluttering up the sound picture. Now, don't take that as a pejorative. It's not intended as an insult or anything, but it's just getting in the way, possibly, of the continuity of the line. And then this is really lovely here. Strings, strings and then winds and this is lovely too a really simple simple direct scoring with that you know this nice little written g here sounding c yeah really nicely done so um so thank you so much for your entry i think this may be the first time that you have entered um uh, this um this challenge and uh, you know excellent quality the next uh, next year's challenge is going to be a completely different style of music, different era, and it's also going to be an example of a kind of style from that composer, which people may seem may feel unexpected, right? <laughs> You'll be thinking, wow, that composer wrote in that idiom, right? And it may make sense to think about it during that particular composer's life cycle. So, um, with those mysterious words, I will thank you for a brilliant entry here, and we will take a look at the next score now.
Great work, Demetrio. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's great to have you back. There are um, familiar faces and there are people who are new and, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like this conversation that continues and continues. And there were, you know, just, as, just as I was possibly not going to have an orchestration challenge this year, there were people who um, didn't think that they could participate at first and then they were able to right? and they sent me a they, you know they'd send me messages about it like I wasn't going to do this at first and then I you know I listened to the music and I just had to do it or I, I just you know I felt the itch or for whatever reason so I'm really glad that I'm able to continue um, seeing from people before and I'm, I'm hoping that everybody who joined this year will join again next year so these challenges can grow a little bit. I mean, I obviously I can't I can't um, evaluate a thousand scores a year because um, then I would have no other job. But um, you know, but there's room for a few more than from last year. So uh, I really enjoyed this score. Um, this you know this opening here. It's uh, okay. So just just to tell you, okay, you are obeying a lot of rules here okay from you know trying to trying to play by the rules in terms of your um your natural brass scoring that's all great um but like in terms of like textures and voicing and and so on and reinterpretation of the harmony and so on that's probably not uh, at all to the period, right? So just to just to let you know, Demetrio. But like, uh, you know, we'll, what we will look at this as like inspired by the period, rather than trying to follow all of its rules. And that is that's true of my uh, score as well. You know, I um, I I bent or broke <laughs> a few rules as well, just because I felt that 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 allowed me to orchestrate my personal voice rather than just you know attempting to be Beethoven. Right. I, I don't think anybody should really try to be Beethoven or try to replicate his his sound, but to to play or to build from it. Right. And OK, so you know, right here, I mean, obviously, this is not intended to be old notation. Right. Because if it were, it would be up a fourth from this pitch. Right? It would it would you know, you would be it, in this, instead of the perfect fifth that we hear below. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, do you want that? You know, the the it's this this it would be this sounding pitch that you see here in bassoon. Do, do we want that to just like continue on and on and on and on and on? Where, whereas this pitch here is actually doubling the um, the second bassoon down here and double bass as well. So yeah, I mean, do we want a fifth rather than a? than a, an octave and you know we I can see why you're doing the fifth here is because you want to have this um, sort of triple octave melody right uh, uh, bassoons uh, below with cellos and then of course the cellos sort of dropping out so that the um, so that the bassoon first bassoon will be a little clearer and then uh, in the middle you've got your first violins uh, and you know they're they are some of their pitches are being doubled by some others and so on, but it's not a it's not consistent all the way through. And then you have your first flute above, um, which will you know as as I mentioned before will get absorbed into the sound of the uh, of your first violins to a degree, but not not you know with the way that you scored this not quite so much right, but still. There'll be an element of absorption to that line. I mean, yeah, it's just really heavily harmonized, right? Just in a, in a way, like you know, if you wanted this to be more, you know, closer to the nineteenth century ideal, then you know, this this is kind of more Brahmsian or or you know, more romantic in a way. Although you know, they also would have scored it differently than this, but. You know, if if you if you want it to be more true to the period, I would say simplify and uh, condense what you have got here, right? 
Um, you can always go take a look at, at how I approached it. And I'm not saying that everybody should follow my example. Uh, and I'm sure that there will be interpretations where some phrases that I have scored will be, you know, scored better than I did it according to my own judgment, right? Uh, by other participants. And that's perfectly fair. You know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the greatest orchestrator in the world. Somebody called me that <laughs> a few months ago. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm not, that's, I'm not going to ever claim that. But uh, yeah, especially not in a situation where I, with this, where I feel that I feel so humbled by Beethoven's example, you know, which is sort of why my defending Beethoven video is, you know, is passionate in a way. You know, I, I, I just feel, you know, I, I understand what, what, Ber what, um, what Bernstein is saying, but in, you know, the oversimplification, like the rhetorical trick that he's using there, I think does a disservice to Beethoven's music and intentions. So. So anyways, but um, yeah, I was raised on Beethoven. I would listen to his symphonies, you know, every day. I played two or three of them a day. I had I had movements memorized in my head and I'd walk down the street and I would be playing them back like a little personal, you know, we didn't, we didn't have um, uh, personal musical devices back then. We just had our memories, right? So that's how I would entertain myself when I took a walk. Or I, you know, I'd write something, write some of my own music while I walked. All right, so I, I think that the doublings are okay. They, you know, things are thick. It's like this, uh, as you might have, you might remember from the pitfalls video, um, like doubling, you know, winds to strings and so on, and those kinds of things are, are not hugely a feature of Beethoven's music. They do occur, but they're not like it's not like the most common thing. Um, he might tend to like isolate textures more in a situation like this and let certain voices come out more soloistically so that they can um, so they could be more intimately expressive right uh, but you know what you've got here is more of a kind of more of a lush romantic tutti where you know it's, it's more or more reminds me of Tchaikovsky uh, uh, than than you know, you know like so we're jumping forwards about you know about 70 years. So, yeah, but I mean, you having said all that, it's like, there's nothing that really doesn't work, right? It's, I think it works fine. And I think it's nice the way that you sort of tie up the phrase, um, you know, with the, with the strings coming back in, like you change the voicing of the harmony right in here to all strings supporting the final repeated note of the melody. Uh, that really worked for me. Um, so here we go. So into the into the melody, like have you set the mood effectively for what you're trying to do here? Yes, I would say so. So does the music, does the melody start elegantly from there? Uh, you know, I think so. I mean, you, you've got your, okay, you've got clarinet doubling with um, with first violins, ya da 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 da. I mean, it's strange. Like, I mean, why? Uh, this is the second or third entry I've seen like this. Why slur across the beat? You know, like, I mean, why not have a, a an articulation and a down bow on the downbeat? You know, why can't you go like down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down? You know, rather than um, probably, I probably would bow this up, down, up, down. I mean, I, I can sort of see the like the. You know, I mean, I, I see what you're trying to do here in terms of the inflection. Do you know what I mean? But I think that like you lose the, you know, the ta on the downbeat. You know, da da as you know. So instead of instead of which would you score da ta ta da. And that just it just feels a little fussy to me, you know. Like like it's not so, it's not so flowing. It's sort of like a conversation more, which I respect, but still, yeah. But this is all really nice here. Now here, like you could leave the the division of bowing to um, you know the division of the slurs and the shorter bowings and so on 
to the strings and then have longer bowing. You know, duh, you know, you just have that under all under one breath in your flutes. Yeah, and, and this is you know this is really lovely the way like you start off with oboe, and then you have the uh, the flutes join in here. And you know once again really heavy scoring, right? Like compared to the simplicity of the material. So, but I mean, does that mean the elements work? Like, do you have a natural transition to octaves? Yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, you already start with an octave and then like you're adding even more weight, right? Or not weight, but even more functions. So that works. Do you expand without clogging up? Well, I mean, it depends on what you think, what you think of as clogged. I mean, I didn't hear anything in this that didn't flow, right? So there wasn't anything that was getting, you know, that was that was kind of interfering with the meaning of any particular line. It's just like, how heavy do you want it? Some people might prefer it lighter, probably Beethoven would, but, you know, but still, I mean, it, it did kind of organically grow and you did have a natural flow to your accompaniment style here. All right without getting to be too acrobatic, right? That's the main thing that I sort of worry about this. And you have a nice division of bows in here. I think that's really nice. And the, um, here there's just a little, you know, oh, it's just a little, yeah. I mean, it's playable, it's just, yeah. Yeah, so this is a little acrobatic in here, but it's still do it's still doable. And this was really lovely right in here, the you know, using the C basso and the F horns and so on. Um that was that was just really lovely. Uh the the motion here in sixths. So um Yeah, and the and you know the second second bassoon with the double basses and so on. And just yeah, just really I mean just nicely put together. Okay, and then here, like you're thinking about a lot of the things that were in my evaluation criteria, like do you contrast with the theme before? Yes, you do. I think that you would get a, um, a clearer contrast here if you didn't have like that extra voice on top, right? If you're gonna start way up here. You know, like if you cut like the, if you cut this, this higher thing going on here with the, you know, starting with first oboe and then climbing so high, then you get a really beautiful sort of almost like spring-like sound, like sort of like just suddenly a fresh, cool air on your cheek kind of sound. Like the way that it is now, it's more, it's more protected because it has everything coming before it, right? So it's not quite as fresh. Uh, but there is a, there is a contrast in terms of the starkness of it, right? And you hear you are supporting it harmonically nicely met at pianissimo i think that that's all perfectly valid now do you really want da ta ta da ta 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 right or would it be better to go da da ta or da da and then here da ta 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 it just feels a little fiddly da ta ta da ta 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 da da ta 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 but that works beautifully on clarinet. I really love the way that you jump the register up one, right? And then like you hear you have like, you have harmonic support, you've got the pizzicato and yeah, and it's, I love the way that the strings change registers like under the different the different wind instruments. It's all nicely done. I like it, Demetrio. And then here you've got just a, a nice row of staccato. Now, one thing I would say here is you could keep going with your flute in unison with the uh, first clarinet here, right? I think that that would actually be wise because the um, the dovetailing here is not, you know, it's not um, it's not an organic handoff or not, uh, not it, like the the um, the way that you've set it up. The linear texture is not automatically it's not like smoothly going one to the other it just really does feel it doesn't you know if you if you really wanted the clarinet to emerge out of the flute part then you would have the clarinet start you know maybe a beat or a beat and a half before coming in with the tri the triplets and you'd have this fading out and you'd have the first clarinet fading in right 
But if you're going to do this, you might as well just have the first flute continue with a mixed a mixed timbre with the first clarinet. And I think you get a much, much smoother sound here. And I would also like here you're you know, you're using up the mezzo forte in a register where the flute is already strong and then as you descend you're getting softer and softer so you're kind of getting away from like there there's no there's no dynamic correction right so i mean you can even hear it on the mock-up like that the flute is just starting to disappear when it gets to this area so i would say just have the crescendo like everybody else can follow this crescendo if you want to but like but the mezzo forte should like go here <laughs> and the crescendo should maintain you know, it's perfectly fine to to diminuendo out of it right but like make the make the strong point right here where it gets to be its weakest and and i think that you'll get a really nice balance of this line yeah and and this is all really lovely here like the rising clarinets and horns and so on and then like little compromising pitches here and the bassoons descending yeah, just really nicely done. Yeah, a good interpretation of this right in here. A nice expansion of the material. And then this is lovely. Dun, 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 dun. So, I mean, just kind of, yeah, a couple of little tippy, timpani notes. So think about some of the, the, you know, the criteria that I have mentioned before. I'm not going to uh, go into them too much. Uh, but what I will say is that um, while I have talked about at least two um, of the previous entries in this compilation, um, here I think that you set up, because of the diminuendo mic mark, <clears throat> you set up the transition to the different texture on this really beautifully. So you don't need to worry about maintaining strength and like continuing on with mezzo forte and then dropping suddenly to piano in the next bar. So I, th I think that this really kind of solved all of that. All right. So those are my comments on this. I think that's I think it's a just a real fun piece of scoring. Um, you know, once again, I'm not sure how true to the period it is, but it really is. You know, I mean, it it is something obviously inspired by it. Um, you know, but like if you want things to sound really much more Beethoven like, then you have to lighten up the texture considerably in the functions, right? That doesn't mean that they'll be simple, right? Or, or, um, or, you know, kind of easy to, you know, just like obvious and everything else. Um, one last little note here, and that is. Um, with this chord here, we're you know if you look at like this B flat here, we've got the um, the B flat of the melody, you know, in octaves here, but we don't really have anything in this position here, right? So you know, I mean, it's just a matter of like thinking, you know, what needs to be doubled. What you know, like, does this G here need to be doubled in the bassoon line? Could you have had your G here and then have this be a B flat, which is just natural, more or less open sound, right? And then you get nice strength on that. Uh, other than that, though, I really enjoyed this and I thought it was a very strong entry. Great work, Demetrio. Let's take a look at the next score. Thanks so much for that, Jerry, for just really lightening things up with this, I don't know, very witty, uh, lighthearted take on the music. 
I mean, there are some elements of this that are, you know, feel somewhat modern to me. And um, there are some others that feel a little kind of like, you know, middle 19th century festival orchestra, you know, like sort of from the era of the big Viennese waltzes and schottisches and, and uh, you know, the French ballets and, and, uh, and operas and so on. This has that this kind of lightness to it. It's really lovely. So starting here, <laughs> um, you know, obviously you are not intending this to be um, limited to period music, um, you know, uh, choices of pitches and things like that, right? So we don't really have to evaluate it on those standards at all. So, you know, right here, this is all pretty lovely and, and it's all very cool. But, I mean, you probably already know, without me even saying it, <laughs> you know, what I'm going to say here. Okay, and that is that, like, while this adds an interesting color, it just really is going to get swallowed up by your horns. Um, you know, and, and you can hear that in the mock-up, right? I mean, you, you would have had to know, right? That, that the flutes here are just incredibly weak. Like, if, if this had been doubling with clarinets, then you would have gotten a fuller tone here and, and some meaningful, um, some more meaningful tone weight and, and combinations. But the flutes are just so freaking weak here, okay? I, I would actually start the doubling from the downbeat, right? Rather than right in the middle of the bar. And like the piccolo here, like, is also in a very weak register. So it's contributing about half of what, say, first flute would on this same sounding pitch. So in other words, like an octave higher than what the first flute is playing here. So like, you know, if you had scored this as like um, first flute and then this as clarinets, then uh, you would definitely have a much clearer, cleaner, more merged sound here. But, you know, I mean, for, for whatever it is, like, it's the kind of thing that they can fix in rehearsal uh, if the horn players are happy just to go up to, like, maybe mezzo piano instead of forte here, and the flutes are playing out, then you get more of a balanced sound, right? But it's just, like, you know, on top of that, I, you, can, you can balance things dynamically, but then you still have the problems of the radiance of tone, right? Just, which you just cannot escape from with horns, especially if you're pushing them above the staff, right? So like you can say, oh, well, just down to mezzo piano here. And then they're still hitting that A, which is, you know, mezzo forte at the softest. Um, I thought it was interesting how your mock-up like just started playing slower and slower going towards the end here. I wonder why. But I mean, yeah, because like I would just imagine this as just a real, you know, a real furry kind of <laughs> kind of roll, you know, right at the end, right? very military and then the, the pizzicato down here this is all this all works fine okay and now here you're you're going on with this ya -da -da, da, 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 and then english horn da, 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 da. right i mean it's an interesting it's an interesting idea um well you know almost I almost wonder whether or not you could like tie this C to a dotted uh, dotted excuse me a um, a dotted half note and then have the diminuendo be like almost instantaneous da 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 and then piano from there to there and then you know then the English horn coming in it just is it's just a lot smoother. And this is just lovely right in here. The yup, bup, 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 bup. Combining that with uh, strings, like nice smooth strings. Beautiful idea, man. Yeah, like it all works. Now, you know, obviously, <laughs> you go places harmonically here that Beethoven doesn't and wouldn't, right? I think he left out a slur in a few places here. You know, do you really want ta and ta ta ta? And these other lines. Okay, so, anyways. Um, yeah. 
And then this is nice, you know, you just have a little teeny bit of harmonic support on the downbeat here. And then done, done. I almost wonder whether or not like you could, like uh, with the way that this sustains all the way through to the end of the bar, it kind of, you know, it really underpins the English horn here. And like, so it's not, it's not really a very free instrument, right? It's like, it's, it it's not really starting from nothing, right? It is, it's accompanied so, I mean, it, it's logical with the way that you're doing the accompaniment style, right? So you just, you, you keep this going and then like it's sort of leading to this next chord, um, which is part of this. So, I mean, I see the, I see how you connect it all together. I see the, the glue there, right? Um, but you just, yeah, you know, with the, with the intensity of everything that, uh, that is happening before, it's not really a fresh start, right? This is my only observation there but it's not a you know it's not fatal or anything I, I think it's an interesting take on that problem and then I mean yeah this is this is nicely done right in here you know like you know once again like harmonically this is going to places where Beethoven wouldn't right but that's like that doesn't need to be your you know your decision your you know your motive for the way that you score it yeah and this just little bit of piccolo above yeah and you know being in the sort of middle register of the piccolo it's going to tend to be sort of swallowed up by the you know by whatever else is going on and you know you're pushing your flutes kind of lower but this is all winds right in here so there's like nothing hugely to interfere but it's just not the you know it's not the choices register here for your flutes but you know you're bringing everything down to a softer dynamic and then having the uh the brass emerge and i think that that's very very strong it's a good way of kind of solving the sort of the corner you're almost about to paint yourself into right here so dun, 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 dun. Now here you have marcato accents on a piano dyna dynamic. So you could almost just do the same thing, mezzo piano with staccatos, right? And then drop back down to piano here. That's just a kind of an easier way of stating that. Yeah, and timpani. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is another thing that really reminds me of kind of like a festival orchestra. I mean, it's like, I mean it'll work, but like it's not really clear that you'll get much difference from say mezzo piano or mezzo forte with accents uh, sorry sorry with um staccato because yeah so the marcata has just kind of like separate you know, uh, 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 so you end up with a short note at piano yeah <laughs> and one little contrabassoon note right here and it kind of just makes me think like could you have gotten away with like like you know we can't hire a contrabassoonist so what are you going to do well what you would do is you would give this g to your english horn player and then um and then just turn this into like a big tenth with um this c on the bottom and the e above right and then you don't need your contrabassoon at all and then you can send it to me with a slightly bigger staff size because we've eliminated that instrument but yeah, and also symbols. Yeah, so if you don't need it, then just leave it out, right? And then you can go up to a bigger staff size with any particular instrument. But I thought it was a a cool use of English horn. Uh, interesting way of transitioning from instrument one instrument to the other. But you know, just like I said before, like if this C is too pungent, and you're you know you're talking about possibly the most pungent um, instrument in the orchestra, <laughs> right? in terms of you know that kind of sort of sticky sound it is really going to kind of dominate even with english horn also being a bit of a sticky sound so yeah so try to i would say just put the diminuo in diminuendo in like almost right away you know da 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 so that this can come in da 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 da, da. and you still have the cont continuity above but it's just not interfering so much i just found that this was not that clear right the rest of the melody but i mean other than that like really cool work and just like just such a cool take on it right just really um 
you know, coming from a very individual place and not trying to score like Beethoven at all. Now, you know, having said that, you might leave me, uh, you know, a, a bit of a hot comment in the in the you know below in the um, below this video saying I did try to score like Beethoven, but I I think you know that you weren't trying too hard if that were so, right? It's a really cool piece of scoring, man, and um, I'm so glad to have you back in these orchestration challenges and continuing on. And you know, I think you're going to get a big kick out of our next uh, our next score next year. Uh, just so different. It's so different from this. So different from a lot of things we've done recently. So um, maybe calling back a little bit to one or two things from before. So anyway, great work, man. And now let us take a look at the very, very last of the scores for this compilation for the 2023 Orchestration Challenge. Really nice, AJ. Um, you only got one serious error on this whole page, and that was here. You're not a contestant. <laughs> this isn't a contest. You are. You are. Nobody wins anything, right? We just um, get the opportunity to hang out together. Um, I mean, it's just you know a choice of words, really. Uh, but you're my participant. You are a member of my community who I value and whose participation I treasure. And these um, these challenges just are really like a, you know they're they're so inspiring to me and they're so fun. And I just I just feel everybody wins, especially me, because <laughs> I get to look at all these scores. So, all right. So let's talk about conflicts all right so you've got some conflicts going on here um so for instance like the voicing of some of these chords is just really weird and part of that is because of the way that you've got this d kind of hanging over right in both your uh, both your cellos and then here your your horns uh sounding an octave higher it just it just really throws this chord way out of whack all right and uh, while my there are a couple others I'll probably miss, but like while I'm at it and just on this topic, we're gonna jump ahead to this page. Okay, so yeah, you know, with this chord here, you know, like you you might think of this as like a G minor over B flat, right? Like you cannot put a a stroke on the um, on the on a C in the timpani, right? It just messes it just messes up the harmony like sometimes you can use an adjacent pitch or some other kind of thing but like in this case that you know the harmony is just so clear like you could have put a d on there right uh or a b flat probably the the best one of all right so because that way you know we have continuity in the in the bass right for our little six three voicing but uh you know, it's it's still like it's just out of whack here to, to throw this like the C works great on these other chords. All right. But yes, yeah, so just try not to do that. I'm not too clear on what D horn in F means. So maybe I'm like this uh, sort of a kind of a language thing. D might be um, like a mean natural in um, in a different language. So if I'm you know, if I'm missing that, I apologize. So yeah, so let's you know let's talk a little bit about those horns while I'm on that topic. Okay, so like you are trying to play by the rules for the most part, like and and there is a wonderful period feeling to this, AJ. I I I really you know I I I appreciated the effort. Um, yeah. So um, there's some confusing stuff going on here in the key signature. 
Um, so like some instruments don't have a key signature and others do. And then instruments that, you know, like actually that you wouldn't want to put a key signature on for the most part have a key signature, right? So these horns in C should, you should just not have a key signature. And same thing with timpani, you know, just kind of, man, you know, I just, it's really not necessary, you know, I mean, you know, not really. I mean, no timpani part has really ever been hurt that I can remember in, you know, hundreds of hours of working with orchestras by not having a key signature. And, you know, more or less, I'd say, like, if you're talking about just orchestral rock repertoire, concert repertoire, and so on, not, not band, not crossover, you know, not jazz, but <coughs> orchestral repertoire, I mean, horns kind of don't need key signatures. But I mean, kind of nothing needs a key signature nowadays, right? Because of the way that we're going into the modern idiom, except for the fact that this is such key-centered music and this is an orchestration of a work from the period of <clears throat> key relationships, right? All righty. So getting past all that, let's get back to our horns. <coughs> And yeah, so, so for the most part here, you know, you really are playing by the rules. There are, are, you know, a couple of half stop notes here and there. Like, you know, we got this F here. Um, we'll have a slight bit of a bite to it. Uh, and and like in here, you got a B and a C. I don't know if I would score that. Like you know, here, you've got like this kind of half stop B natural. And here we have a B flat and a C, excuse me. So it just... I don't know. I mean, it sort of works, but yeah. And then you know, just to stick with the um, the whole natural horns thing. Uh, yeah, this this is all pretty nice. You know, once again, you have have a couple of F's in there, but like it's it's all going to work fine. Alrighty. So um, so now. <laughs> Just look, let's look at the actual structure, texture, functions, everything else. So you're starting off here with um, you know, fairly solid uni unison here of, um, of first violins, clarinet, uh, F horns, and so on. And I mean, it's a beautiful, intense, thick, um, moody tone, right? So like, you know, like my first question usually is like, you know, does this set up the feeling of, you know, is, is it a good introduction to what's happening? Well, I mean, it, it does and it doesn't, right? So it's like, it's, it's very, it's, it's somewhat somber. Do you know what I mean? It like, like what follows is a, you know, is, is something really beautiful and airy and light and classical and so on. But like the, the, the real kind of, um, you know, horn plus clarinet plus violins gives it this sort of um, real um, kind of kind of a thick, um, like I was saying before, moody kind of a tone. Here, I have to set something up. I, I um, had to turn off one of my screens because it was messing up my um, uh, my recording. Um, let's see here. Yeah, there we go. So I'm just using my laptop to look at the evaluation criteria. Um, all right. Apologies. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, but I mean, you know, it. it I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right. So just like you might want to think about that. You know, that timbral quality. Well, I mean, it is a beautiful idea, though. You know, like the. You know the harmony here, and the natural brass, and the you know the the middle strings here. You know they're just kind of working together, not always completely in sync, but but just you know having a nice relationship. Um, so I mean it, it works for me. Now, um, does the melody start with elegance? I, I would say so. It's it's really lovely. You know you're. You, you know, you're starting off, da, 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 and then you go to octaves, da, 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 da. Um, that's such a cool idea. And then you, like, you sort of dovetail over to flute. I would say fade out here. Uh, and then the flute continues on playing octaves. And this is, like, the way that this is scored, the flute will actually play out to a degree, right? 
This is nice. And then like with the with the uh, um, oboe, uh, you, 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 you know, you sort of have like a one of each sort of situation. But even at that, you're not telling me like if this is first oboe, second oboe, who's who is on this. Uh, there was a sort of a staccato-ish sound coming here from the bassoon, so I would say just mark the staccato in the bassoons, right? And that especially goes well with the pizzicato strings in here. Now here, you, you kind of just dropped the, um, the piano slurring onto your strings rather than really thinking about slurring um, helping out like where the bowing goes, right? And, and so like, you know, the way that you've scored it, it really just goes, you know, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Do you see what it is like the way that it so like it, it would be better for you to like just think think of like maybe you could slur by the half bar or something like, you know, um, up with a slur and then down, up, down, up, get rid of the slur, down, up, down, right? You know, so there's a, just a bunch of or you could go down, up. So there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Just like a lot of it has to do with the inflection, right? That that you are left with once you work out a bowing pattern. Go check out my um, my video and look at how I slurred for bowing, right? <clears throat> now here, like you're thinking about it, or seemingly. Da, 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 da. I have to say this was really a fast introduction. It kind of got over everything really quickly. I, I felt it just felt a little rushed. I think you could go back down to 40. I, you know, I think it that's more in touch with where Beethoven would be at. And this is really kind of fun, the way that you, you know, you're using the timpani in a very playful way. And, and I would say, you know, it's totally not what Beethoven would have done, but the timpani scoring that I have in my approach to the, um, to the second movement is also not what Beethoven would have done at all. Okay, now this is lovely right in here. Now you do not need to mark, like if you're going this fast, 120 and you've got 16th notes, it's just kind of fiddly to write in the, the staccato. You're going to get that separated sound at that tempo with that duration of note, right? So you don't really need to write in the staccato. So just, yeah, da 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 dum. And so, see the confusion here that's left by having one you know, one group of violins in with a key signature and the other one without, right? So here you have like two identical pieces of music, but one of them has flats and the other one doesn't. That's the kind of thing that just really messes people up when they're reading your score. And then here we have ba -ba 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 -bum. That's nice. A nice, uh, a nice way like you're doubling the violas and the cellos and then you're coming in with a double bass to like supply the note that the viola can't. I mean, it's a cool solution. And, you know, here's a place where you could use that little touch of timpani. Da -da 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 -dum. And this, yeah, and see, it, this is consonant with the F major chord that this is outlining. So that works great, right? Uh, you know, and just like a little touch of oboe right in here. I would say that, like, if this is piano, crescendo, and back to piano, this should also be piano, right? Because this is just too soft, right? It's, yeah. And, and, you know, you might want to have this slurred, right, just for clarity. Like, I mean, the, the oboe player can easily play this all staccato and separate it, right? Da, 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 da. They're just brilliant at single tonguing. But, I mean, do you really want that kind of sort of, sort of slightly jerky sound? Uh, or just do you want something really flowing here, right? And then here, this is all separated. Da, 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 da. This is interesting. You jump up, right? Like here, the... The oboe and flute line continues on dovetailing into the clarinet line, but here you jump up the octave um, to these pitches up here, which, you know, by the way, is the, that this will get absorbed. Um, if you've been following along and, and watching the other evaluations, which I hope you, I hope everybody in this video is watching everybody else's evaluations and commenting on them. Um, yeah, so, so like you'll probably notice that I mentioned that you know, flute tends to get sort of swallowed up by strings below it, and especially when you go down into the middle register like this, right? Like this, this will really de definitely get devoured by the first violins. Yeah. Yeah, now here, like you would sort of have to tell us, like here you have a single, you have two single notes and then you have intervals, right? So 
who's playing this? Is this the first player or the second player? Same thing here. Is who's playing this first note? Is that the first or second horn player? I think that like you could have really utilized uh, additional voices in your winds, right? Uh, you know, you just solve some problems here in your brass, right? Just you, you know, maybe you need you'd only need like one set. Like if you had, if you had a second oboe player and a second clarinet player, then maybe you only need to have C horns or F horns here, right? And you kind of don't really need all four voices because they could be supplemented by other lower winds or middle winds. Yeah, and so you know, yeah. So once again, we just have a situation of dropping the piano slurs onto the onto the winds and strings or in this case strings and brass parts without really kind of thinking about like how the players are going to be playing right do you really want this to be down right one long down bow or do you want to just get rid of the slurs altogether and just go down up down do you want to maintain a little bit of strength here so like you it's interesting like you're sort of starting from pianissimo and then going towards piano but like that's not really what beethoven is saying you know he's like he he's assuming that you're already at piano and that you're going crescendo maybe up to mezzo forte and then just suddenly going subito piano right but like you could also just continue like the like since you're setting up a nice texture here with the way everything is is played you could easily go to you know a fuller texture and continue on at at a louder tempo and then drop back down yeah this is really lovely right in here but you know once again like don't use a c to underpin a g minor um six three chord right i mean it would be better like that you just gave yourself another pitch on your timpani and just gave yourself a b flat here that just will work out tons better so you know here when the C is consonant with the other pitches, it's it's perfectly fine to, to throw in a C even if it isn't the bottom note of the chord. All right, so here you're going to go in E, C. So it's, um, so, sorry for my out of key singing. So this is, yeah, so yeah, just better to, you know, you can score these two C's in a row here. <clears throat> Yeah, so, I mean, one of my concerns here was, is there an emphatic color of line? Is the harmonic density setting up what's following it, right? And here you had sort of different ideas about texture, sort of bringing in the brass. But even it's even at that, this feels like a build towards this. So if there was a way of making the continuity work a little bit better here, um, and then... And then if you are going to go, if you're going to push a little bit more and have a slightly louder kind of a uh, continuation, then you get the dynamic contrast if you drop back down to piano here. And this is nice too, like throwing in the timpani here. Um, but yeah, but you would, whatever, whatever happens, whether you're going to keep this piano or whatever, you need to mark your entrances. You need to mark the dynamics of your entrances. Right? And then here, like you just, you can't have a slur on one part and not on the other parts. Right. I think that with the approach that you're taking here, it's better to not have any slurs. Right? Just go, you know, down, up, down. Yeah, I mean, just some interesting uh, voicing on some of these chords. That's something that, like, if I were coaching you um, as your orchestration coach or whatever, you know, like, like we maybe work through some of these some of these chords and just see how well that they worked were there any notes any pitches that you could take out was the balance correct and so on and so forth but we kind of don't have time for that that might take us another 20 minutes so i will just say that like there was a lot here that worked and then you know just i just feel that like in terms of finalizing things and just like really thinking about the whole score as you know a document and you know, that's being used by the conductor and giving them all the information. You still have some work to do on that, AJ. But, you know, just in terms of like imagination and colors and inspiration and things like that, I think you did a hell of a job. I'm, you know, I, I really like this a lot. So I am glad to, you know, have you as a participant in this and to participate as much as you'd like. So um, the next 
Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, next year's selection is going to be completely different from this, different era, different composer, different period of their life, which is not is not really something that you would imagine from that composer knowing from their other works. So, so yeah, so um, a really nice entry and a great way to bring this particular compilation to a close. So with that, I'll just finish this off by saying, you know, if you're, if you got a, you know, if you are part of this compilation, um, best way to thank me is to comment on everybody else's uh, everybody else's efforts, right? Even if you feel completely uh, unqualified, right? Like to give an opinion, you can always tell somebody that you liked it, right? Or what you liked about it. And, you know, that is just like that cycle of encouragement and, and thoughts, feedback, and so on. It just, you know, it makes the community stronger and it makes each one of us stronger and it makes me happier and it makes gives me the strength psychologically to continue doing these because I know you guys are growing and learning from it and sharing your thoughts and so on. And that just makes a huge difference to me. So thanks so much, everybody, for all their efforts and for the scores that you sent me. And, um, you know, I just feel really happy that I didn't miss out on all of these great scores when you know I could easily have just not had a an orchestration challenge this year just because of the you know all the stuff that was happening so um, so thanks for that everybody and I will see you very soon with the sequential letter C um, coming up you know the release will be in a day or two I think see you then